in order to find the distance to stars, it's not so simple. You actually have to uh, measure things in really strange or really interesting ways. Uh, first of all, I love this picture here. I love you. I love you too. Oh, kiss me. And then everybody dies. Uh, okay, so let's talk about distances to stars. There's a number of methods of doing it. And because you can't go out and you know measure it yourself, you have to use some other proxy ways. Um, and the most accurate one is the parallax method. I mean, you experience parallax every day, right? I mean, your eyes themselves are really nice sort of parallax machines, assuming you have two that work. Um, you can see depth, can't you? Uh, you ever seen this little trick, for example, you hold out your thumb, for example, and then you open your, uh, close one eye, open one eye, and then you sort of put your thumb in front of something that's sort of in the distance, like maybe like a doorknob or something like that, and then try to switch which eye is open. Um, and you'll see that your thumb appears to move. Obviously, it doesn't. That's just because there's a difference in what your left eye sees and what your right eye sees. What happens is your brain is so amazing at this, when it notices a difference, it says, oh, that's close. Whereas if your thumb was really, really far away, for example, um, then you wouldn't see so much difference in this. So uh, this, this allows you to see depth. Well, we can use this for stars as well, because what we can do is... If we can see, basically the idea is to use the same sort of concept as like with your eyes, right? And it turns out the further out your eyes are, so to speak, um, the better depth perception you'll have. But it necessitates that this, this thing, like I had my thumb, for example, it has to be in the foreground, it has to be you know closer than the background that you can compare it with. So the parallax method uses that sort of idea. The idea was that the stars themselves are so far away that maybe there's a close one and it acts kind of like our thumb would in that sense. Where, you know, if we can sort of take a picture and then take a picture and if we see it move with respect to the background, then we can say, aha, we know it's distance because we can use some trigonometry. The problem, of course, is that when we tried that, you know, with like a, two different telescopes a few meters apart or whatever, we don't see any difference. And that's because stars are so far away. The angles get so, so small. They're almost impossible to detect. Uh, so this is the way it works here. So let me show you something. Um, so let's just assume there's a whole bunch of like a, a background stars. Okay, so I'll just draw a whole bunch of stars in the background. There we go. And then what we do is we try to make our eyes, so to speak, the farthest apart they could be. Now you think, uh, maybe I can put a telescope on one end of the Earth and one on the other end, but even that's not enough. But luckily, we're clever about this, right? So here's what we do. We take, you know, for example, here's the sun. And if this, so here's the Earth. Now, the Earth goes in orbit, of course, around the sun. What we do is we take an image, let's say, um, on June 1st, let's just say, we take an image here of some star. Now, the important thing is going to be that we look at a, a background star. It has to be compared to something else. So let's just say we're looking at um, this particular dis star right here, this one right here. If we're looking at it, though, it's going to appear, whoops, sort of, whoops, I did a really bad job drawing there. Maybe I should use a little ruler thingy here. There we go. So, for example, we can draw something like this right here, and then we can draw something like this. What happens is, six months later, when the Earth goes you know, halfway around its orbit, we can take another picture. And we look at that particular, you know, we just look at the night sky there. And so what we would do, of course, we would see that picture uh, six months later, and it would look like, let's see here, something like this. Now, what this really means is this. Like, what's really going on? I mean, we actually take a picture here. What we're going to see is we will observe that this star looks like it moves. That's because, notice, the background stars would all be the same. You know, the background stars would look the same. Like, imagine I'm looking at a little window here. Here's what it would look like. I would actually see these background stars. Let's say one, two, I put one over here, one over here. Maybe in the picture on one day, uh, maybe I'll color code these actually. Just wait, watch, I'll do something a little bit better. What I'll do, I'll color code them. I'll make this one uh, sort of this purplish color like this. So what I can do then is say, all right, so uh, when I took this picture at this time right here, do you notice that this star then will appear somewhere in this line right here? In other words, it'll appear maybe here. Do you see that? Like, you know, if you look at it compared to the other stars. Whereas on another day, let's say those six months earlier, because I want to take that picture. Do you notice it was sort of lined up with these ones? So it'll be sort of like, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll see it like right here. Do you notice then, or maybe I'll uh, erase that, maybe I'll put it in between them like this, something like that. You know, it'll appear somewhere over there, or it'll appear somewhere over there. Uh, 
So the interesting thing is that, I mean, it's not exactly drawn that way, right? This right here would be in front, but something like this. Do you notice that this one here is moving? It appears to move compared to the background stars. So what's really going on is because this star is closer, right? it's a lot closer compared to the background, that we actually are seeing it sort of appear to move like your thumb did. It turns out through some clever geometry, what we can do is say, all right, well, um, if we can take sort of a straight line right here, because of course we can measure this angle. Turns out we can measure that angle theta here, uh, just like we can measure, oops, but I'm really bad at drawing straight lines in freehand, that's for sure. That's an angle right there. Because of that, we can actually use some geometry right here. And if we make this right here, whoops, make this right here a straight line going down and going across like this, we can do a bit of trigonometry. You ever heard of this sort of Z trick of the two parallel lines, this one and this one, this angle right here will be the same as that angle there. So because I can measure the angle that I can actually see it at, I can then get that angle there. And it turns out you can use tangent because tangent is opposite this right here is one astronomical unit, the distance from Earth to the Sun. This right here would be the distance then, this right here. Turns out you could do a tangent is one over D, but it turns out at very, very, very small angles. I mean, if the angle is really, really small, um, a sufficiently small angle is tan of theta is just theta. So that's why we can actually use this equation right here. So in other words, tan of theta is just pretty much theta. So then you can say then that this angle um, is equal to just one over D. Conversely, d is equal to 1 over the angle. Now this angle, instead of calling it theta, they call it p instead. That's also this right here would be actually p, the parallax angle. So we can define then the distance to a star by using this. The distance to a star, and we have something called a parallax angle. Now what's important is to know the units that we use for this. The parallax angle, we don't use meters for it. We use parsec. And it turns out there's going to be a reason for it. A second here. And distance to the star, that'll be, oh God, what did I do? The parallax angle is in parsec. The parallax angle is in arc seconds. I don't know what I was thinking. There, there it's in arc seconds. I'll explain that. What happens is if you take um, a whole entire sphere and you split it up into degrees, that'll be 360 even parts, right? You have 360 degrees in a circle. So imagine you take a whole circle, you split it up into 360 small pieces. Now, those, these angles are so small, even a degree isn't enough. So you can split up each degree into 60 even pieces. We call those minutes of arc or arc minutes. But even that's too big. So you take each of those 60ths of a degree and you split it up into 60 even pieces and that's called an arc second. So one arc second is one 3,600th of a degree, which is crazy small. And those are the angles we measure. We measure actually like a decimal, like a point oh something, like point oh three arc seconds or something like that. So the distances to stars, they're actually measured in a unit we call parsec. And the reason we call it a parsec, if you think about it, if we define this right here, what if we made P1? Then D would be 1. Do you see that? And it turns out that's what 1 parsec is. 1 parsec is the distance uh, with the parallax angle of one arc second. That's why we call it a parsec, because the distance for one parallax angle, let's put it like this here, watch. The distance for a parallax angle of one second. So if we have a parallax angle of one arc second, uh, then we call that one parsec. And again, one parsec is 3.26 light years. This is a great method of finding distances. It's geometric, which means you know it works really well. It's very accurate. The problem is it only works for close things. If it's too far away, we're not going to see it. You see that? We won't really see that parallax angle changing. So that's why it's useful for close things. It's very accurate. It's, the, it's probably the most accurate one we have. But it only works for relatively close things. Uh, then we have spectroscopic parallax, which is a misnomer because it's not really using parallax. Um, this uses this idea of an HR diagram again, so we talked about it before. Let's say this here is the main sequence stars. If we can find a main sequence star, if we can tell from its spectrum um, where it lies, where its peak um, wavelength will tell us its temperature, then from there we can sort of read off then what's the luminosity. Do you see that? We, from there we can get the luminosity. So we use a spectrum to know where it sits on the axis here. We use that to estimate L. And what happens when we know L? Do you remember that f uh, equation I showed you a few videos ago? Remember we have this, b equals l over 4 pi d squared. That's sort of the magical equation, isn't it? So if we know l, 
then we know d. But remember, this d is in meters. It's really important to remember. That d is in meters. Right? The other distance, the distance from the parallax method, that distance is in parsec. It's really important to keep those different distances um, separated from each other so we know sort of what's going on. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to do uh, distances using uh, C-feed variables.